hi everybody. Welcome to this week. We're talking about Roman literature. I'm sure when we're talking about Roman literature, you're thinking, oh, that's boring. But you know what? It's not that boring. A lot of our ideas come from the past, you know? And we just kind of spice it up with whatever is going on in society. And history repeats itself anyway. So a lot of the same stories and ideas could be changed in today's society and given the same meaning. So this is about Roman literature today. Oh, wow. In the old days, they didn't have TV. Look at that. So they didn't have TV back then, and they didn't have cell phones or iPads. They didn't have cable or even Roku or the Netflix and Voodoo and Hulu and all that stuff. They didn't have their Nintendo or their Sega or their Xbox. But you know what they did have? They had their oral speaking ability, communication. Some of the best orators came from those times like Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, and Alexander the Great. We also have some of the great mathematicians during that time like Pythagoras, the Pythagoras theorem, if you remember him from geometry. But we see here people are talking and people are reading and writing because that's the forms of communication they had back then. Some people were illiterate, so they couldn't read and they couldn't write, but they could speak. So there's always a way for us to get our information down and use communication skills, whether it's oral or written. Well, like I said, back then they didn't have TV and they didn't have YouTube or any of the things we have now like TikTok. So they just had to do their speaking. Sometimes they would speak just to a small group of people. Sometimes it would be a big group speaking outside in a large arena or forum. So what's a sophist? Any of the certain Greek lecturers, writers, and teachers in the fifth and fourth centuries BCE, most of whom traveled about the Greek speaking world giving instruction and a wide range of subjects in return for fees. This was retrieved from Britannica. History of the name. The term sophist, Greek sophist is an early application. It's sometimes said to have meant earlier simply clever or skilled men the list of those whom Greek authors applied the term in its earliest sense makes it probable that it was rather more restricted in meaning. Seers, diviners, and poets predominant the earliest sophists were probably in the stages of the early Greek societies. This would explain the subsequent application of the term in the seven wise men, 7th to 6th century BCE, who Typhus, the highest early practical wisdom and pre-Socratic philosophers. Generally, when Pythagoras, in one of Plato's dialogues, Pythagoras is made to say that unlike others, he is willing to call himself a sophist. He is using the term in the new sense of professional teacher, and he wishes also to claim continuity in the earlier stages as a teacher of wisdom. Plato and Aristotle alterated the meaning again, but however, when they claimed that professional teachers such as Pythagoras are not seeking the truth, but only victory in debate and were prepared to use dishonest means to achieve it. This produced a sense of captious or fallacious reasoner or quibbler, which has remained dominant in the present day. Finally, under Roman Empire, the term was applied to professors of rhetoric to orators and prose writers, especially those of whom sometimes are regarded as constituting what now is the second sophist movement. So as I mentioned earlier, I mentioned to you Aristotle and Plato. They were like the kings of philosophy and oral communication. But then we have Pythagoras moving right along to the next slide. 
We have the fifth century sophist. The names strive of nearly 30 sophists, properly so-called, whom the most important were Pythagoras, Georgius, Amphinin, Prodicus, and Thrasymachus. Plato protested strongly that Socrates was no sense of a sophist. He took no fees. His devotion to the truth was beyond question. But from the many points of view, he rightly regarded as rather a special member of the movement. The actual number of sophists was clearly much larger than 30. And for about 70 years until about 380 BCE, they were the sole source of higher education in the more advanced Greek cities. Therefore, at least at Athens, they were largely replaced by the new philosophical schools, such as those of Plato and Isocrates. Plato's dialogue, Pythagoras, describes something like a conference of sophists at the house of Collis in Athens just before the Philadelphian War. 431 to 404 BCE, Antares of Medane, described as one of the most distinguished of Pythagoras' pupils, is there receiving professional instruction in order to become a sophist, and it's clear that this was already a normal way of entering the profession. Most of the major sophists were not in the end, but they made Athens the center of their activities. Although traveling continuously, the importance of Athens was doubtless due to the part of the greater freedom of speech prevailing there, and part of the patronage of wealthy men like Callias, and even to the positive encouragement of Perlicus, who was said to held long discussions with sophists in the house, but primarily the sophists congregated at Athens because they found there to be greatest demand for what they had to offer, namely instruction from young men and the extent of demand followed by the nature of the city's political life. Athens was a democracy, and although its limits were such as Pythagoras could say it was governed by man, Hercules is nonetheless gave opportunities for a successful political career to citizens of the most diverse backgrounds, provided they could impress the audiences significantly in the council and assembly. After Pericles' death, the avenue became the high road of political success. The sophists taught men to speak and what arguments they use in the public debate. A sophist education was increasingly sought and both by the members of the oldest families and by aspiring newcomers without family backing. The changing pattern of Athenian society made merely tr traditional attitudes in such cases no longer adequate. Criticizing such attitudes and replacing them by rational arguments held special attraction to the young and explains the violent distaste in which they aroused in traditionalists. Plato thought that much of Sophus' attack upon traditional values was unfamiliar and unjustified. But even he learned at least one thing from the Sophist. If the older values were defended, it must be reasoned argument, not by appeals to tradition and run for reflecting truth or faith. As seen in the point of view, sophist movement performed the valuable function within Athenian's democracy in the fifth century BCE. It offered an educational design of to facilitate and promote success in the public life. All the sophists appeared to have provided training in rhetoric and the art of speaking and sophotic movement. They're responsible for large advances in rhetorical theory, contributed greatly to the development style of oratory. That means oral speaking. In modern times, the view occasionally has been advanced so that it was sophist only concern. But to the reign of the topic dealt with by the major sophists, 
makes this unlikely, even if the success and the direction was the ultimate aim. That means they were sure as much indirect as direct for the pupils were constantly instructed in merely the art of speaking. But in grammar, in the nature of virtue, and basis of morality, in the history of society and arts and poetry and music and mathematics, also astronomy, and the physical science. Naturally, the balance and the emphasis differed from sophist to sophist, and some offered wider curricula than others. But this was an individual matter, and attempts to early historians of philosophy divide the sophic movement into periods in which the nature of the instruction was alterated or now seemed to fail or lack evidence. The fifth century sophists integrated the method of higher education that in the range of the method anticipated the modern humanistic approach integrated or reviewing during the European Renaissance. The nature of Sophistic thought. A question is discussed whether sophists in general had any real regard for truth. or whether they taught their pupils that truth is an important compared to the success of an argument. Plato's hostile judgment on both counts, it's still frequently repeated without question. The Platonic writings make frequent reference to what Plato calls aristocratic, who fond of wrangling and analytic. The two often have been incorrectly treated as identical. Aristotic for Plato consists of arguments aimed at victory rather than truth. Analytic involves the assignment to any argument of a counterargument that negates it. With the implication both argument and counterargument are equally true. And a logic is a sense that's especially associated with Petrangus, but Plato no doubt correctly attributes the use of sophist well. He regards the use and analytic as essentially erratic. Whether it be used to silence an op opponent by making his position seem self-conductory, or whether it be used mechanically to negate any proposition put forward in a debate. He concludes that the widespread of analytic is evidence that sophists had no real regard to truth, which must itself be free of analytic. But Plato himself believed for much a possibility of all his life that the phenomenal world was essentially analogical in as much as no statement about it could be made possessing a greater degree of truth than the contradictory of that statement. For example, if a person is tall in relation to one object, he will be short in relation to another object. It is so characterizing the phenomenal world. Plato certainly did not wish to be called heuristic. He regarded the application of analytic and description of the phenomenal world as a central preliminary in the search for truth residing in platonic forms which are themselves free of analytic. Seen in this perspective, the sophists use the analogic must be judged less harshly to the extent it was used irresponsibly to secure success in the debate, it was heuristic and temptation. So to use it must often have arisen, but where is it invoked? And in sincere belief that analytic elements were indeed involved or where it was used for analyzing a complex situation in order to reveal complexity, then analytic was in no way inconsistent with devotion of truth. This raises the question to what extent the sophists possessed any general view of the world or gave expression to any genuine philosophical views, whether original or derived. Each two writers influenced Plato and Aristotle seem to have excluded the selfish part of Pythagoras from the schematized accounts of the early Greek thinkers. 
modern writers have frequently maintained that whatever else there were, the Sophas were in no sense philosophers. Even those who acknowledged the philosophical interests of certain particular doctrines attributed to individual sophists even tend to regard these exceptions as the claim is much sophists were not in school, but only independent teachers and writers and class, they were not philosophers. Two questions are involved. Whether the sophists held common intellectual doctrines or whether some or all of these could actually be termed philosophical. Among modern, George William Frederick Hale was one of the first to reinsert the sophists into the history of Greek philosophy. He did so within a framework of his own dialectic in which every thesis invokes its own opposite or antithesis. Thus he treated the sophists as presenting the antithesis to the thesis of a group of philosophers known collectively as pre-Socrates. His Socrates, such as Thetis, Helonius, and Paradines sought the truth about the external world with the bold enthusiasm that produced a series of explanations, each claiming to be correct. None of these explanations of the physical world paid attention to the observer, and each was driven to reject more and more of the phenomenal world itself as unreal. Following with the Eletics, the fifth century school at Idla in Italy held the reality of a static one of which Perinus and Zeno are representatives. Little nothing of phenomenal role was left to real. The trend is to turn produced a growing distrust of the power of human beings to attain knowledge of the ultimate basis of natural phenomena. Philosophy reached an impasse and there is danger of complete skepticism. Such extreme position according to Hegel's view provoked antithesis of the Sophetic movement, which rejected the thesis of the objectives and concentrated attention upon the humankind rather than upon nature to Hegel. The Sophists were subjective idealists, holding the reality is only the minds of their contents. And so philosophy could move forward by turning its attention to the subjective element of knowing reflection upon contrast between the thought of sophists and that of their predecessors produces the thesis of Plato and Aristotle. Whether any of the sophists actually were subjective idealists may be doubted. The conclusion depends on part of whether Pythagoras held that phenomena had subjective existence only, or whether he thought that all the things perceived had objective existence, but were perceived differently according to the nature of the predicament and the relation to him. Whether he interpreted phenomena subjectively or relativistically, it is clearly fairly clear. However, that sophists did concentrate very largely upon human beings and human society, upon questions of words and the relations to things, upon issues of theory of knowledge, and upon the importance of observer a subjective element in reality and the correct understanding of reality. This emphasis helps to explain the philosophical hostility of Plato and Aristotle, particularly in the eyes of Plato, everyone who looks for the truth and phenomena alone, whether he interprets it subjectively or relativistically, cannot hope to find it there. And his presence and turning away the right direction virtually amounts to the reduction of philosophy and the search for truth. Many a subsequent thinker for whom metaphysics or investigation of the deepest nature of reality was a crowning achievement of philosophy has felt with Plato. And the sophists were so anti-metaphysical that they have no claim to rank the philosophers. But since the mid 19th century, there has been growing appreciation 
of a number of problems and doctrines reoccurring in the discussion of the sophist in the fifth and fourth centuries BCE. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, the sophists were considered charlatans. Their intellectual honesty was impurged and their doctrines were blamed for weakening the moral fiber of Greece. The charge was based on two connections, both correct first and many of the sophists attacked the traditionally accepted moral code. And second, they were explored and even commended alternative approaches to morality that would condone or allow behavior of the kind inadmissible under the stricter traditional code. Much less weight is now attached to these charges. First, many attacks on the traditional morality were the, the name of a few uh, morality that claimed to be of greater validity. Attacks upon particular doctrine often claim that accepted views should be abandoned as morally defective. Furthermore, even when socially disabled, action seems to be commended. This is frequently done to introduce a principle necessary to any satisfactory moral theory. Thus, when Thermidius in the first book, Plato's Republic argues that justice is unwanted when it merely contributes to another good and is not a good of the doer, Plato agrees finally there is no evidence that any sophists were personally immoral or that any of the pupils were introduced to moral actions by sophitic teaching. The serious discussion of moral problems in the theory of morality tends to improve behavior, not corrupt it. Writings. In addition to teaching, the Sophists wrote many books, the titles of which preserved by writers such as Dianetics, Letterists, who probably diverted them from library catalogs. It has been especially been supposed that the writings themselves hardly survived beyond the period of Plato and Aristotle, but the view requires modification in the light of papyrus finds. Merely few were copied from Sophitic writings in the early common era. It also has been possible to identify the works of later writers, certain limitations, or summaries of fifth century Sophitic writers whose names are unknown. The most important of these are the discussion of the law of Peritius and the exhortation of philosophy. By the third century CE Syrian, Neoplatonist, Lebrius, and the so-called Daisy logo found the manuscripts of the sexes in Perea's third century CE. This evidence suggests that while most later writers took their accounts of the sophists and early writers, especially Plato, the original writers did any case survive were consulted. Particular doctrines. As part of the defense of sophists against the charge of immoral teaching, the English historian George wrote in 1794 to 1871, maintained that they had nothing in common with each other except a profession. As paid teachers qualified young men to think, speak, and act with credit to themselves as citizens. This denial of common doctrines cannot be sustained. The evidence is against it. While sophists were not in effect, the set of obligatory beliefs or doctrines, they had common interest in the whole series of questions to which they ought to apply solutions along with certain clearly defined lines. There are great difficulties, however, in the precise reconstruction of individual sophitic doctrines. No complete writing survived from any of the sophists to check the accounts found in Plato. And later writers were often but not always dependent upon what they found in Plato. Plato doubtless knew well the doctrines of individual sophists, but was writing for those to whom these doctrines were already well known and he was always more interested in following the argument where it led than providing precise statements of other people's view for sake of prosperity. Consequently, almost everything that's said about a particular sophist doctrine is subject to controversy. Well, there are theoretical issues like relativism and skepticism. Relativism and skepticism has been regarded as common features of sophetic movement as whole, but it was early pointed out that only the Pythagoras and Georgias is that any suggestion of radical skepticism about possibility of knowledge. And even in the case of Sextus and Proteus in his discussion of skepticism is probably right when he declares that neither is really a skeptic. 
Protagoras does seem to have restricted knowledge of the sense of experience, but he believed empathetically that whatever was perceived by the senses was certainly true. This led him to the sort of the tangent does not touch the circle at a point only, but along with definite length of the circumference. Clearly he was referring to the human perception of drawn tangents and circles. Georgias, who claim that nothing exists or that does exist, it cannot be known, or it exists in his knowledge, it cannot be communicated to another, has been accused of denying all reality and all knowledge. Yet he also seems to have appealed the very discussion of these themes to all the, uh, search, the certainty and perceived facts about physical world that chariots do not race across the sea. Others dismiss the whole thesis as satire or joke against philosophers. Probably neither view is correct. What Georgius seems to have been attacking was not perceived reality, nor one's power to perceive it, but attempt to assign existence and non-existence with the metaphysical implications of subject operation to that one of the perceives. There is evidence that other sophists like Hippias were interested in questions of this kind. It is likely that they were all concerned to which degree the rejecting claims of nonsensical existence, such as those of electronics. The sophists, in fact, were attempting to explain the phenomenal world without appealing to any principles outside phenomena. They believed that this could be done by including an observer within the phenomenal work world, their refusal to go beyond phenomena was, for Plato, the greatest weakness in thinking. A second common generalization is about Sophus has been that they uh, represent a revolt against science and the study of physical world. The evidence is against this in as much as Hippotus, Prodicus, Georgias, and Protagoras. There are records of a definite interest in questions of the kind the truth is rather that they were in revolt against attempts to explain the physical world by appeals to principles that could not have been perceived by the senses. And instead of framing new objective explanations, they attempted to explain things where explanation was required by introducing the perceiver as one element in the perceptual situation. One of the most famous doctrines associated with sophetic movement was the opposition between nature and custom or convention and morals. It's probable that the antithesis did not originate in the sophetic circles, but rather earlier. It was clearly very popular and figured largely in sophetic discussions. The commonest form of doctrine involved in the appeal from conventional laws is supposedly higher laws based on nature. Sometimes these higher laws are invoked to remedy defects in the actual laws and impose more stringent obligations, but usually it was the order of free the individual from restrictions unjustifiable imposed by human laws that appeal to nature was made. An extreme form of appeal involved the throwing off of all restraints upon self-interest and the desires of the individuals, the doctrine of Cullius and Plato's Georgius that might, if one possesses it, is actually right. And it was this, more than anything else, that gave support to the charge against sophists of immoral teachings. On the other occasions, the terms of antithesis were reversed and human laws were explicitly acclaimed as superior to the laws of nature and as representing progress achieved by human in Denver. In all cases, the laws of nature were regarded as not generalized descriptions of what actually happens in the natural world. And so not like the laws of physics to which no acceptations are possible, but rather as norms that people ought to follow, but are free to ignore. Thus the appeal to nature intended to mean an appeal to human nature, treated as a source for norms of conduct. One of the most the, to the Greeks, the appeal was not very novel. It represented a conscious probing and exploration to an area wherein, according to the whole tradition of thought, 
lay a true source of norms of conduct. The Plato Colises represents a position actually held by a living sophist when he advocates free reign for possessions. Then it was easy for Plato to argue and reply to the human nature. If it is fulfilled, requires the organization and restraint in the license, given the desires of particular aspects of it, otherwise the interest of the whole will be frustrated. Both Plato and Aristotle is basing much of their ethics in the human nature are only following up by the approach began by sophist. Then we have humanistic issues. The sophists have sometimes been characterized by their attacks on the traditional religious beliefs of the Greeks. We have Greek religion. It's true that more than one sophist seem to have faced prosecution for impurity, as did Socrates also. Protagoras wrote concerning the gods, I cannot know either that they exist or they do not exist, nor what they are like in form. And Perdicius offered a sociological account of the development of religion. Critias went further when he was supposed that the gods were deliberately invented to aspire fear in the evildoer. It was thus probably correct to say that the tendency of much sophatic thought was to reject the traditional doctrines about gods. Indeed, this follows almost indentfully if the su supposition is correct that all the sophists were attempting to explain the phenomenal world from within itself while excluding all principles or entities not to dissemble a phenomena. But in the agonistic attitudes for the Olympian deities, the sophists were probably at one of the most pre-Socratic philosophers of the sixth and fifth centuries, and also with the thinking people living for the end of the fifth century, it thus probably misleading to regard them as revolutionary in their religious beliefs. The importance of sophists attached to the human beings meant that they were extremely interested in the history and organization of human societies. Here gains much most as known as Pythagoras, and there's a danger in treating his particular doctrines as a typical Socratic movement as a whole. In the fifth century, human history is commonly seen in the terms of decline from an earlier golden age. Another view proposed that there are occurring cycles in human affairs according to which progression from a good to bad would give way to one gone from bad to good. This typical Socratic altitude towards society rejected both of these views in favor of one that saw human history in the terms of progress from savagery to civilization. As one myth, Protagoras explained how human achieved civilized society first with the aid of arts and crafts and then by gaining a sense of respect and justice in the ordering of the affairs. The general thinking of most of the sophists seems to have been along the similar lines. So one of the most distinctive sophistic tenets was a virtue that can be taught a position springing naturally from sophist professional fame to be the teachers of young men. At the word virtue implied both success in the living and the quantities necessary for achieving such success and the claim that archery would be taught by the kind of teaching the sophist offered had far ranging implications. It involved a rejection of the view that came only by birth by example, by being born a member of a noble family. It involved also the rejection of the doctrine that archery was a matter of the chance 
occurrence of specified qualities in particular individuals. RD was a selfish view, it was a result of the known and comfortable procedures, a contention of profound importance for the organization of society. Moreover, what can be taught has relation to what is known and understood. The belief that teaching has high intellectual caliber would produce success both in the individual and for the government and had profound influence upon the subsequent history of education. Once again, it was thought acceptance of the doctrine by Plato and Aristotle that the sophistic position came to be part of a subsequent humanistic tradition. And there you have it. This is the Roman literature and Greek literature. And we have some of the great influencers like Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras. Just to mention a couple of the most popular ones that were like founding fathers for philosophy in those days. We can see from history that philosophy in those days and communication was also connected to math and critical thinking. Well, thank you so much and I'll see you in the next PowerPoint.